Well, as you know, distracted is in the headlines. We can barely pick up the newspaper without an article about state legislatures trying to ban texting in the cars. Um, I just heard that Hugh Jackman was in a in the Australian actor uh, stopped the play he's currently in on Broadway recently and berated someone in the audience for keeping their cell phone ringing and ringing and ringing. Um, and uh, I actually Googled distracted and found 11 million hits. So, I mean, that in itself is distracting. 11 million pieces of information. Um, so, how did we get to the place where the norm for both our children and adults is noisy, cluttered, fragmented, overloaded, speed driven? I mean, how did we get to the place where we keep one eye on our Blackberry and one eye on our spouse in bed? You know, where kids, in, in, in a culture where kids are exposed to nearly six hours of non-print media a day. Well, I think to understand this culture of distraction and how we came to be in this place, we need to move back from the headlines and from the here and now and from the symptoms of this distraction and look at the deeper roots of how we're using our technology, how we're using our attention. And that's one thing I'd like to do tonight. Um, secondly, I would like to talk a little bit about how uh, our culture of distraction is affecting our children and our classrooms, our, our family lives, and our workplaces. So I'd like to talk to you as, as both parents and educators and professionals and citizens. And then thirdly, uh, I'll speak a little bit about what we can do. Because if the opposite of distraction is attention, then the key question before us is, how do we uh, recover this scarce resource, this human faculty that I think is the most important that we have? Um, last spring, I also went to see the play called Distracted. I don't know if you heard about that. On Broadway, it starred Cynthia Nixon, and she was look, looking for, she, she was portraying a mother who was looking for a solution to her child's ADHD. Uh, and uh, at the end of the play, she came to an epiphany. Oh, what my child really needs is attention. Uh, and she's right. But on the other hand, uh, it was, it's not so simple, I think, as she thought. So, um, so first, how did we get here? Well, the, um, the economist Jeremy Rifkin once said, the greatest turning points in human history are often triggered by changing conceptions of time and space. So I'll start there. Time and space. How do we experience time in the digital age? Well, for most of human history, people mark time. They use the uh, sun and the seasons and cultural holidays and the bells and the whistles to um, give them clues when to work and to play and to celebrate. They were marking time. But then in the industrial age, along came radical inventions like the cinema and the phonograph and the camera uh, that allowed human beings to feel that they could control time. Uh, you know, the phonograph captured the voice of the dead. This was astonishing. And the cinema allowed people to run a moment backwards, forwards, stop and start it. Again, this was revolutionary. Uh, and now we are, I believe, layering time. We've gone beyond this industrial age idea of controlling time to think that we can actually jump start or, or supersede the boundaries of time. This is what multitasking is all about. We think that by time splicing, we'll really get two things done at once. And as you might know, 60% of children now multitask their way through their homework. Uh, one, uh, one in every, I mean, the average information worker switches tasks every three minutes throughout the day. Uh, and uh, we, and high, a third of high school and college students juggle five to eight media while they're doing studying. Um, and of course, their parents are role modeling. As I mentioned, information age workers switch tasks every three minutes, and parents are showing them this sort of uh, culture of split focus throughout the day. I uh, once interviewed a man who felt finally that he had to get his Blackberry habit under control 
when he f had found himself pulling it out at his grandmother's funeral. He finally thought, I've got to get in control of this machine. So this layering of time really changes how we pay attention. Um, and secondly, where are we? You know, in space and place. What is our relationship to place that actually affects how we pay attention as well? Uh, when George Washington died in 1799, it took a week for the news to reach New York from Virginia. In 1963, 70% of Americans knew in a half an hour that JFK had been assassinated. You know, bang, global village, global as they say now, global and local. The railroad, the jet, the car, uh, the telegraph even, and now the internet have shattered distance. So we're living in a world where we can seemingly be anywhere physically in a few hours, or we can send a message instantaneously, and we can. Um, we're a nation on the go, a culture of mobility and portability. We talk about um, hoteling and dashboard dining and travel soccer and hot desking and you know words that that talk about how much we're on the go and in fact the number of miles that the average American traverses um, every day has risen 80 percent in the last 20 years you know and having just driven in from New York I can <laughs> empathize with that um, so today again our Relations to time and space and place are changing how we uh, experience living and changing how we pay attention. Um, we flip between people and tasks, we layer the moment, we keep one eye on the road, and we uh, uh, explore alternate realities, you know, cyberspace and boundaryless, the boundaryless world. We have new frontiers for movement. And this is a world of connectivity, of shattered distance, of Skyping grandma, of visual wonders, but it's also a world for our adults and for children of fragmentation and diffusion and flux. So what does this new world that I've described do to our relationships, just for starters? What does it do to our ability to connect deeply? Well, Picture a baby born into the digital age. Relationships are, of course, her lifeblood. You know, she needs to, first of all, learn to focus, to connect with caregivers. That's the starting point. That's the baby's first job in life. And I'd like to read just a little bit um, from my book about this crucial skill of attention Called folk, that we call focus and that scientists uh, call orienting. By four to six months, babies are looking machines, according to one scientist, casting their tiny spotlights of attention on one after another item of interest. Gradually, two separate parts of their brain, at the parietal lobe at the crown of the head, uh, learn to work with other brain areas to allow the child to focus. At first, a baby orients willy-nilly to the bright, the shiny, or the noisy, but gradually she can focus on nearly everything she chooses. In neurological circles, this is as exciting as a baby's first steps. And the young human, ever curious, is simultaneously built to share this ability to focus and to explore her world. Like baby monkeys riding piggyback on their mother to see the world, healthy human six-month-olds can look where a caregiver looks, and then by 18 months old, they can understand when they're sharing a moment of focus. This is called joint attention. It's a seemingly simple but extraordinarily rich moment of first connection, courtesy of this developing orienting network. Joint attention is a meeting of minds that's critical to social, language, and cognitive development with a role in developing early verbal communications that's hard to overestimate, according to the philosopher Naomi Elan. One of the first signs of autism is a deficiency in joint attention. Autistic children miss others' bids for sharing attention, and they don't initiate shared focus, so they become marooned socially. 
Orienting, then, is much more than a scout. It's our bridge to one another.